I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. I believe Bitcoin is the thing that is going to eat up all of the other value in the world, all of the monetary premium in the world. We want at least a free competition between Bitcoin, between the, the fiat currency, between maybe even other cryptocurrencies, which is fine for me because I feel like in every free market, Bitcoin will win. Inflation is violence. Inflation is aggression against everyone, but it's subtle and it affects the most the people at the lowest rung of the ladder who are least able to do something about it. Once you have taxes, you cannot have democracy. It's going to be nothing but a good thing to get Justin Trudeau out of governing that country. I reject the dogma of the large religious institutions, but the message of Christianity is very, very good. First question, you told me you're planning a new book, which is always really exciting because I love the process of like condensing information into like a small piece of Uh, uh, um, small piece of medium right, when we say it like that and um, what are you planning there and like maybe before that what inspired you to write the book sure well the book is a collaboration with myself and Knut Svanholm and Knut is is honestly he's the main author on this project I'm I'm co-author I, I want to insist on on that uh, he's he, this is his fourth book, uh, well, maybe even more than that, if you count various re-releases and, and all this. Uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a spiritual successor to the book Everything Divided by 21 Million, which is the, the meme that Knut uh, popularized or even uh, coined, came up with all this. And the new book is called The Inverse of Clown World. Full title is Bitcoin, The Inverse of Clown World, but that's sort of a misdirect. I don't want to give away the full picture, but the idea is that The book is really about you, the reader, and the idea that what what we or you can do to fix clown world through tools like Bitcoin and other freedom footprint increasing technologies. And so to, to answer your question about the inspiration is that this is about a, about a two year process through our show, The Freedom Footprint Show which started uh, a little a little under two years ago now, actually, uh, when when I got involved with Knut's publisher at the time, and they, they wanted to help Knut start a podcast. They thought he'd be really good at it, and that's turned out to be true. And I had been doing some podcasting before I got into the Bitcoin world, and I was looking for my own way to contribute. And so I came on board as their producer initially, but... Uh, I, I was I was on camera the the whole time I was part of the show, uh, and pretty quickly it it turned into that it was really just me and Knut uh, had a really good rapport, and we started up this Freedom Footprint show, and we've been off to the races ever since. And so this last couple of years of of running this pod has turned into a whole bunch of ideas. We've distilled it down into it's going to be about twelve chapters, it looks like, and so. Uh, if you're familiar with Knut's books before, they're sort of uh, uh, semi-standalone essays that all uh, have have some kind of interesting point. Uh, and in and in this one, the uh, the essays kind of all build into each other. And uh, we're hoping that that it's uh, it serves as a good call to action to take responsibility through Bitcoin to improve yourself and improve the world. That's a really, really cool uh, concept of a book. Um, are you actually, actually doing the, the Freedom Footprint show and Bitcoin full-time, or do you have something else also? No, no, I wish, I wish. But uh, yeah, I've, I've got a fiat job. I, I work in cybersecurity. I don't mind, I don't mind uh, saying that. But uh, yeah, it, it's, it's completely unrelated to Bitcoin at the moment. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good job. I, I, it's going to be hard to give that up while I, I still get a good salary through something else. But uh, I, I wish I could direct all of my energy into Bitcoin. That would be the ideal thing. But right now, it, it makes sense to also keep stacking some sats through, through some external income but one day uh one day the goal is definitely to transition into to bitcoin full-time let's let's see if it's this cycle or next one i, lo I love it uh, i already actually worked also in in, in cyber security before uh, till yeah till february till end of february like since march i'm not there anymore uh but uh i, I quite liked it there but it's 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 not bitcoin unfortunately <laughs> has some you, you flaws. <laughs> we'll have to That's compare good. notes on that at some point yes um, maybe let's talk about Clown World in general. Uh, Clown World, I feel like it's a, um, a word, uh, a phrase that gets thrown around a lot. 
Like uh, it's like one of the phrases where you're like someone doesn't like something, it's clown word. <laughs> I feel like uh, it's associated with a lot of uh, a lot of things, uh, but it has a lot of truths to it. Um, what is for you clown word? Like what is uh, the, the the definition of clown word for you? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question, and I, I think as you say, it's it's different for everyone. But to me, it really ends up being these distortions of the world, uh, distorted incentives that that result in crazy behavior. People doing things that they otherwise wouldn't do because the system is set up in such a way to to uh, make it profitable to do things that are either violence against your fellow man or just absolute craziness to avoid getting uh getting pilloried by the mob it's 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 a lot to do with fiat actual fiat uh certainly i i think that's the case that that the world uh that it that doesn't have a a fixed money supply is going to naturally have skewed incentives and it also skews the incentives for people to just get by in the world, essentially. So when you have a state able to control money, right, then then the state also is able to control its citizens' behavior. And the, the way that I put this myself and that we've written about this in the book is that this is, this is all down to the, the concept of praxeology or a, a part of Austrian economics, essentially, uh, where that if uh, uh, it all comes down to, to human action and human behavior and that the only right in the world is the right to be left alone and all other so-called rights uh, essentially have to violate the right for someone to be left alone eventually. Like, for example, if a politician were to to say that everyone has to get free housing, okay, well, maybe you can find someone who's willing to build a whole bunch of houses for people, someone who wants to to go be a, a builder and construct houses, and, and that person wants to do that to get paid money to do that. But someone else has to pay for that, right? So eventually someone has to pay, someone has to be forced to pay or money has to be created out of thin air in order to pay the bill. And so it's a subtle form of violating everyone's right to be left alone or violating everyone's right to not have violence done upon them, right? And inflation is, inflation is violence. Inflation is aggression. Inflation is aggression against everyone, but it's subtle and it affects the people with the, if it affects the most the people at the lowest rung of the ladder who are least able to do something about it this is this is related to the uh um the i'm blanking uh the 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 effect of those closest to the the money printer uh so yeah it, all of this together contributes to misaligned incentives and governments and states able to force their population to do certain things skewing behaviors I think like incentives is like everything, uh, because when you have the incentive to do something, uh, you probably will do it. If there is no other incentive there's, that is stronger than that, or there's some nothing other uh, behavior that uh, is underlying of that. Um, so like we're fixing the money, that's that's a, a big part of, of everything that, that is going on with the world. Um, but is there anything that uh, besides the monetary system, because you also like kind of pointed out there's like, uh, in the book, you have Bitcoin, but there's also other things you can do. Is there anything else that you think when you talk about the system that is wrong with the world that needs to be fixed outside of the money, outside of the uh, uh, system? Is like politicians, privacy. Is, is there anything else that you see like outside of money that we have to fix? Yeah, it's it's all about freedom. It's all about freedom. And the, the other things than Bitcoin... Bitcoin is one freedom technology. There's there's a, a term that floats around sometimes that some people are identify as freedom maximalists, not Bitcoin maximalists. I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. That's what I believe myself to be. I believe Bitcoin is the thing that is going to eat up all of the other value in the world, all of the monetary premium in the world. And I'm a maximalist towards that specifically. Freedom maximalism, I think, is a different concept. And 
I, I, I don't like to go out on a limb and say this is what I identify as anything other than Bitcoin, but freedom maximalism is a good goal. Absolutely. Maximizing individual freedom is, is I think, what needs to be done. And there are a few ways that, that you, anyone can, can do to, to increase their freedom footprint. That's the, that's the term we like to throw around there. And, and so one of those things absolutely is, is privacy. Technologies for, for privacy generally. Things that make it so that people can't find information about you online. Now, Bitcoin has its own privacy layer, and there's there's been its its own uh, there there have been challenges with that essentially, where governments have been saying that efforts to increase privacy on Bitcoin are actually illegal, and and this has been related to most recently the the arrest of the Samurai Wallet developers, and then Wasabi Wallet voluntarily taking down its coin join service, but. Coin joins are incredibly important, and right now it's one of the only ways for for privacy to be done on Bitcoin. There, there are other other ways for privacy on Bitcoin to be possible. The Lightning Network, to a certain extent, has some some aspects of privacy. the the Litwick The Liquid Network is also a, a very good option that increases privacy uh, if, if, if you use it a certain way. In, in all cases, though, it's it's just the, the concept that no one else but you has the right to know how much Bitcoin you have, where it's being spent on, and and it, in technologies to increase the ability to to keep privacy uh, is is vastly important for me. So I, I think it, I think it's it's a tragedy that that Samurai Wallet developers the even the tornado cash guy. I, I, I mean, the the principle is the the same. He might have been working on Ethereum, right? But but it's it's the same the same concept that that speech should not be uh, banned, bannable, right? And and really, what they're doing with with banning some kind of code is is banning speech. And then Wasabi is is clearly taking the approach of. Uh, uh, prioritizing not going to prison over over having the the technology be run by them, but but the the coin join protocol, the Wabi Sabi protocol, is still open source and and coordinators could could crop up. That's that's certainly something there, and there are other decentralized methods of of doing coin join, for example, and uh, uh, other things such as, for example, uh, I believe it's called silent payments, which are trying to do something that to to me it looks a little bit like how Monero works, but but. Uh, um, it's it's not exactly the the same. Uh, so so there are just lots of options for for privacy and increasing those options and doing more for that is is one way that will help Bitcoin from from being co opted by governments as a as a medium of control. But there are of course other other ways to increase privacy, increase freedom. Another another interesting idea is the concept of flag theory. In other words, getting as many passports as possible to be able to. Uh, play jurisdictional arbitrage essentially so that if if one country or nation state decides they don't like you anymore uh, that you could go to uh, another country or or at, at least be able to travel somewhere else that uh, that would would allow you to uh, escape the long arm of of uh, a nation's so-called law so and and I just want to say here as well I'm not advocating for for law breaking or doing doing anything illegal I am advocating for that that these things should not be illegal. Privacy shouldn't be illegal, and it should certainly be. Uh, it, it would be it would be great if we had a world where where some people didn't need to have multiple passports. But uh, for example, Katie the Russian and uh, and uh, others in sort of this this uh, freedom um, movement. Um, Lyudmila Kozlovska, I think, is uh, is is Ukrainian, and I've met also uh, I've met also people from like the Alexei Navalny camp, and and they all talk about how Bitcoin is being used for freedom, and uh, this is, all these people are kind of in this in this camp of Bitcoin being used as a freedom tool, and uh, and uh, Bitcoin as as uh, as a way of getting around absolutely insane government controls in places like Russia and and, and others, and so. All of these things together are are building blocks that you can use to build your own freedom footprint, something like that. So mm, I love it. And is what I'm thinking a lot is uh, the internet is not there since a long time, and a lot of the privacy aspect is there because of the internet. Uh, so when we come with social media, they want to listen in to WhatsApp messages and stuff like that. It's uh, now also popular with the EU election uh, here. Um, is there 
a global war on privacy uh, intentionally or are they just trying in a really bad way to get that internet stuff under control, which I don't think they have to get under control, but <laughs> maybe they're just having good intentions and they're like, oh, let's, let's regulate this stuff. I'm really against that. But uh, is, is, do you think that's like a really uh, um, uh, um, a war on privacy with all the stuff that's going on? Or they are just trying to do the same thing that they are doing since uh, hundreds and thousands of years just in the internet now? Well, the good intentions thing is interesting. And and I think to some extent, good intentions are at play here. Not everyone is evil. I, I do believe that, that uh, even, even people in higher rungs of, of power in organizations that, that some might deem evil, World Economic Forum as one example, I don't believe everyone associated with that is, is evil. I do believe some people specifically at the top are this interesting constellation of narcissism and narcissism and uh, egotism and psychopathy that that just creates absolutely evil people who who want to control others and and uh, and and do that through through political means or other forms of of holding power but that's not everyone and so good, the good intentions part of this this is the interesting thing this is all about security and security always comes at the expense of convenience always and security is one of one of these things that society as a whole somewhat has to take together and that really conflicts with with an ideology of of individual freedom right and so the the idea here is that is that encryption technology has been a tool for for people to send messages to coordinate to do to do acts of violence against other people but it is also a tool for for people who are being surveilled by their government to be able to communicate together without that government listening in right so all of this stuff is a- anyone can use it people can people can use these tools for good people can do use these tools for evil and maybe even just to de- define those things a, a little bit a- at minimum something evil is 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 something uh intentionally doing violence to another person what and violence can mean physical harm it can mean taking possessions uh, it, it can mean forcing someone to do someone they don't want to do those things are evil if 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 someone commits violence against another human that's that's the beginnings of evil there are degrees but that's that's a, a pretty easy one i think uh and and then and then uh, the these technologies that that governments want to use to to for example surveil people well they always say that there it's it's good intentions right if if you're not doing anything wrong what do you have to fear of the government reading your emails right but then the government gets to decide who is doing something wrong and it's going to be arbitrary. It's going to be someone making a decision. And somewhere along the line, there's going to be someone who decides that what you're doing isn't in the government's best interest or isn't in their best interest. And and they can then decide to take action against the offender. And it's 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 like the 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 quote, they first they came for the trade unionists and I wasn't a trade unionist first then next they came for the communist I wasn't a communist next they came for the Jews they, I wasn't a Jew then they came for me I'm, I'm paraphrasing and I probably got the order wrong but it's it's that's a real quote right and and totali- totalitarianism is is going to increase their means of control in, in whatever way possible and and uh, eventually it's going to be a society of people that either fully obey or people that are brutally brutally repressed and and that's not a, a world I want to live in and and that's also not a world that that results in success the, this is visible from space if if uh, looking at a nighttime shot of the Korean Peninsula there's there's a bright South Korea full of lights and 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 full of economic activity and then there's an almost completely black north we've been running an experiment on on uh communism versus capitalism for it's it's 70 years something like that over there and and east and west germany is a is another example absolutely that's still being felt today that you can see in in all kinds of demographic lines uh, all, all kinds of statistics you can see the 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 east west germany divide literally just in things like percentage of population that votes for a certain party or percentage of unemployment or, or this and that you can clearly see the the divides there right and so th- this is stuff that echoes in eternity and it's also it's also uh, a, a reason to 
prioritize individual freedoms and reduce the onerous governments that want to want to control and just get in the way of human flourishing. Love that so much, uh, and especially when you talk about the tools it has could, could be implemented. Um, because this is the thing that I also think is really, really dangerous with CBDCs, uh, which re is also really dangerous with putting in uh, monitoring devices in WhatsApps and stuff like that, that the EU now wants to do. Um, even if the people now have really good intentions, there will come a person that has not. <laughs> like even if everyone at the level has really good intentions, They will die at some point. There will someone come up and someone will be like, Oh, we could also do that with that power. Uh, and there will come some, someone along that has like really bad intentions and misuse the technology that is there. So why are we building it in the first place? It's like, uh, if you're a criminal, uh, you might not use WhatsApp in the first place. Anyways, if you really want to do something criminal, you might be uh, intelligent enough to not do it over WhatsApp. Because we have so many examples that WhatsApp chats has been leaked. So why, why do we do WhatsApp anyways? Uh, so the, those are some, some questions that I ask myself. Um, about flag theory, I have uh, one more uh, question that you brought up, flag theory. It's really interesting for me. Uh, Austria, as I know of, does not allow actually a second uh, passport uh, at the moment. I know that there are two... I think two political parties that I, parties that are actually, um, fighting for that, that you have, can have a second one. Um, what, like when you, uh, think of a second passport, um, do you have any favorite nation that you are looking at? Like, is like, uh, El Salvador now a really, um, popular thing for you where like, okay, there could be something really interesting or do you, do you look at any other nations that you like? Uh, I want the second passport from that nation. Well, so th this is an interesting question. And again, this is going to differ for, for everyone. For myself personally, I'm working on my own second passport. I'm from Canada originally, but I've, I've uh, m migrated to Finland in the last few years. And, and so eventually, I, hopefully, I'll have uh, passports from two of the most uh, statist <laughs> regimes in, the, in the, the whole world. But thankfully, they're both, they're both uh, relatively free by other measures. So I'm allowed to say that. But Yeah, Canada and 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 the EU both together, maybe maybe either of them on their own might might be a little bit of cause for concern. But both but having having both together, I think is going to be good. And and in all seriousness, I I intend to live in in Finland if I possibly can. It's a, it's a great place to to live. But that doesn't mean that having alternatives isn't isn't going to also be on my mind there. It's unfortunate when jurisdictions don't allow multiple passports but it also is sort of a, a unitary thing like it's it's who 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 knows about that right uh in 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 some cases it comes down to that uh, what would the the country do if you if you got to second citizenship i think india is an example uh, that that really understands when someone gets another citizenship and then they they make their uh, overseas citizens become sort of a, a different status that's it's still sort of a citizen of of india but it's it's a, it's a different status i don't know the exact details but i've i've, I've met people that, that have been making this decision uh and 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 so i mean it, it's unfortunate when that's the case uh, but but for for me i i don't have that that issue both both uh, canada and finland allow the the dual citizenship and so that's nice El Salvador, you mentioned El Salvador. That's that's uh, yeah, that's a big one for Bitcoiners, of course. And El Salvador is really trying to attract a lot of talent. And and in fact, this is this has been uh, an area of a bit of controversy that El Salvador, for example, uh, Nayib Bukele, pr the president there, suggested that that maybe they would give five thousand visas to top scientists, doctors, philosophers. Uh, and and they would they would just select some of the best of the best, but there was some there was some backlash in terms of that sort of these people are kind of skipping the queue, uh, so to say, and and uh, coming in 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 front of people who might not have these these same qualifications. And I, I don't really have any concerns with that. In fact, I think an arms race for countries to attract absolutely the best talent possible is is the way to go here. Canada has a problem with keeping doctors in the country. Uh, the 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 there are a lot of things set up that make that make it that Canadian doctors don't earn a lot of money. It's a fully public healthcare system, and so doctors can have their own practices and they can set up corporations to be 
uh, to be private practitioner doctors, but they, they still have to go through the same billing system and offer the, the same things. Uh, so so in, in, in other words, the, the Canadian healthcare system is, is basically just a complete fiat machine. And so doctors have a limit on, on what they can earn. They're not, making, they're not making millions in Canada. Maybe they're making hundreds of thousands, but then they have to pay all their costs for, uh, for their overhead, to, for their offices, for uh, any, any administrative employees, th- assistance, things like that. And so they, they, they make a, a, a living, but they, they're not getting extremely wealthy. But the way that that this is uh, that they get taxed is essentially through uh, capital gains tax through their corporation. So the the money that has been paid into a doctor uh, in in Canada then sits in their corporation, the doctor's corporation, and then they withdraw it to to create a salary, uh, essentially. But that money then gets taxed on any capital gains income uh, uh, at the point of. Uh, at the point of withdrawing it, and the Canadian government, Justin Trudeau, is just increasing that that it's it's going to go from a fifty percent uh, taxation rate to a sixty six percent taxation rate. Now, I don't I don't mean that that I don't, don't get me wrong. That's not that it's uh, taxed fifty to sixty six percent. It's that fifty uh, percent was eligible for taxation, and now sixty six percent is eligible for taxation. So there was, in other words, there was an incentive to to have this structure that not all the money was was actually taxed uh, but the the amount of money that that doctors now specifically get to take home is going to be far less and so Canada's already been having a problem attracting doctors well why don't those doctors go move to El Salvador or some other country that's going to let them keep more of what they earn right and and so El, El Salvador wanting to take in so many of the best people so that they can create a wonderful society full of smart people, ambitious people that want to improve life and the life of those around them. I mean, that's great. And I hope that this arms race intensifies and that countries compete for, for their top talent. And at the moment, the, the Western world sort of isn't doing that. There, there, there are, of course, uh, uh, incentives for people to immigrate into into certain countries, but the taxation regimes and uh, the the rules and regulations in Western countries are just so high that that if it weren't for the the quality of life and the welfare state of of Western countries, well, I, I would see no incentive to to immigrate to one of those places uh, and, and just going to a. a uh, a place where there is less regulation and less taxation would would make a lot of sense, but the decision to move somewhere anywhere is is a complicated one. the The top line sort of uh, flag theory places that basically sell passports for some amount of money. Uh, Antigua, I believe, is the is the one that uh, um, Katie the Russian and and uh, her organization, they, they, that's the one advertised. I think it's the lowest cost one at the moment. But there are others. Usually it's some amount of hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of, of dollars, euros, take your pick. Usually it's denominated in, in US dollars. Uh, golden visas is, is sort of what they're called. And, and so if you have the, the wealth to be able to, to get uh, passports for yourself and your family at one of these other countries. Usually, the usually it's not even a case of wanting to go live in that jurisdiction, but it's also just a passport that's internationally recognized, and you can go travel to to other places through that as well. Uh, it's it's a rainy day uh, situation, even though maybe it's it's quite nice to go uh, move in, or spend some some time in Antigua or uh, other Caribbean islands or islands in the. Uh, Pacific or 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 something like that. That's usually where they are. But uh, Portugal specifically has has had some golden visa visa incentives, and there, there's other places in in uh, in the world that that offer these things. So it's all about finding the the right one. But uh, there there are a lot of a lot of options, and uh, it's going to be an individual choice uh, compared to anyone. I'm good with my uh, my second passport from Finland for now, but maybe in a few years I'll be. Looking at uh, a third, maybe El Salvador's on the menu there. Yeah, and I feel like we're seeing the sovereign individual and other similar books playing out in real time when we have uh, upcoming nations like El Salvador, when you look at it like 2020 or 2019, uh, high murder rate, uh, tourism was 
uh, not high. Uh, it was like uh, not a good country to live in. It was like starting from a really low place, uh, except maybe from the surfing <laughs> aspect of it. Uh, but now they are like climbing the ladder a little bit and they're going in at least in the right direction. Let's see how it, it turns out in the next like five, 10 years. Then you have countries like Canada uh, that did quite great, uh, but in the last couple of years, you kind of see where this is going. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting to see how this plays out, especially now when we have more and more remote work, we have more and more uh, possibilities, even with Bitcoin, you can like just store your uh, wealth in your head and go over borders and you, I don't want to encourage anybody to break laws, but you could do it quite easily and just go over borders if, if you know how to do it. Uh, so that's, that's really interesting how the, the sheeps get uh, wings and then can fly to other borders without being interrupted too much. <laughs> it's, it's like, that's how I see it. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, the, the funny thing there with Canada is that it's, it's really just been a case of, I, I think, I think Canada has been too nice and, and there's, there's a desire among a, a large part of the, the Canadian population to just be nice to everyone and, and take care, take care of people. It's, it's over an overactive empathy gland, and and I think the the results of this have been that the Canadian governments do more and more and more for the the populace, but that all has to come at the expense of higher and higher taxes and printing more money. And the the COVID pandemic was was seriously not good for the the money supply in Canada, and it just ballooned. And I, I left during the the pandemic, but I. The economic times in Canada had been bad for for quite a long time, especially Western Canada, where I'm from. It's it's an oil and gas heavy region where the the economy is is heavily based in oil and gas, but it's 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 done in in some of the the best way in the whole world. The safety standards and the environmental standards are are the best in the world over there, and so it was oil and gas being produced ethically and in you know and it's 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 a commodity that is needed. Energy is needed. There's no such thing as a low energy, high wealth country. It's, it's high wealth, high energy. That's that's what happens. And if you're low energy or low wealth, that's just the, the equation. And so in, in Canada, Justin Trudeau demonized the oil and gas industry and, and put in countless measures I, I mean really quite a lot to to make it more difficult to produce oil and gas at competitive r- rates competitive prices and so uh, it, it, carbon tax is is a, another one as well and I mean that's that's just there are many bad taxes but a carbon tax is is really quite ridiculous uh, but but the the results of this was that was that the Western Canadian regions were were starting to do quite poorly economically, uh, especially when 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 oil is down, the, those regions do do poorly. But but usually it, it bounces back fairly quickly because the commodity prices eventually even out. But but this time this started back in roughly 2016. It, it was just a long period of time where where the government was against a region of its of its own country and and the economic times there were were just rough anyone could lose their job at any moment and and there was no such thing as job security there was really no no under no, no ability to plan for the future uh be because because everyone just had 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 to worry about uh having the next job lined up or or other things like that it was really quite stressful, and I, I tried to get myself out of working in industries that were directly tied to oil and gas. I, I moved into cybersecurity from from some other stuff that was more directly related to the oil and gas industry myself, uh, and that was one attempt to do that. But when I got the opportunity to move to to Finland after uh, it, this was in about 2021, uh, I, I I took it. It was an adventure, a uh, lot of uncertainty there, but I've I've loved it. Uh, and and definitely it wasn't the only uh, the only reason I moved wasn't just the economic situation in Canada, but it was a big factor. And the the result is that it's only gotten worse since since I've left. Inflation in Canada is is absolutely brutal. Food prices are are through the roof. The money supply something like doubled, I believe, since since 2021 or maybe 2020. 
And yeah, Canada Canada just has incredibly poor governance to to blame for it. And uh, there's going to need to be a lot of work done to to fix that. And maybe truthfully, Canada can't be fixed in its in its current form. I, I would not be surprised to see Canada segment into more than one country. But thankfully, there are a lot of good people in in Canada, good Bitcoiners who are working towards increasing Bitcoin adoption in Canada and and doing lots of good things over there. Um, the the guys at Bull Bitcoin, I think, are are very specifically uh, heavily involved and well known internationally. That's like Francis Puglio, Dave Bradley, Maddox. If you've seen his art, uh, lots of great stuff going on there. So, uh, yeah, I'm I'm somewhat optimistic for Canada. It, it, because of people like that, but I, I do think in the the short to medium term, there's going to be more pain there, unfortunately. If you are listening to this podcast, you might be wondering what is actually the setup look like of Robin, or how can I improve my Bitcoin setup? And there's two things. You have to buy Bitcoin from the right source and you have to store Bitcoin the right way. Let's focus on the first thing how to buy Bitcoin. It's simple. Have a Bitcoin only exchange. Don't deal with the shitcoin exchanges. Don't deal with an exchange that has an own token or something like that. Be on a Bitcoin only exchange. I use 21 Bitcoin. 21 Bitcoin is for me the best partner for that. And now where do you store Bitcoin? Bitcoin should be stored on a hardware wallet, on a self custody solution where you yourself hold your keys and it should be a cold wallet. So that's my simple solutions. That's a bit box. You just put your Bitcoin on there, back up your seed phrase, and you are better than 95% of all Bitcoin hodlers. If you have more than a thousand euros in Bitcoin, it's an absolutely must have. One last thing before we get back to the video. I'm really passionate about meeting other Bitcoiners. And there's an amazing opportunity in middle of Europe in June, the Bitcoin Prague conference. It's the best and biggest Bitcoin only conference in the whole of Europe. For all Americans, please visit Europe and visit this place in June. For all Europe's, it's a must go anyways. You are so close to the Bitcoin Prague conference, you basically have to come. I will do interviews there and I would love to meet you all there. Use code ROBIN for all my sponsors to get discounts and use the links down in the description. Yeah, and one of my favorite Bitcoiners, uh, Jeff Booth, is also from there. So, like, there's hope, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Can't forget Jeff. <laughs> um, which also brings me to an interesting topic. Um, I was really interested in politics before Bitcoin. Like, I was uh, on on Austrian level, like not high, but I I was on the on the street the directory where I got quite high and I was really involved with, with the elections. Like I was a coordinator between Austria. Uh, it was so, so much that I even like went at one point before election, I had like 60 hour job in a party where I just coordinated a lot of stuff and I was really involved with politics. And the funny thing is the more and more I got to realize what Bitcoin is and what money is, I got more and more away from politics to that point right now that I'm like, not involved at all like i'm sometimes watching some debates i'm sometimes seeing what's happening but i'm really not interested in it in it uh, anymore because i feel like bitcoin if bitcoin succeeds it's kind of forces a free market onto the world which is an interesting thought do you also think like when bitcoin actually succeeds as the the sound money layer in our our financial system that governments have to be a little bit more capitalistic and a little bit more freedom loving in general or is that just uh, wishful thinking of my side well, let's see if governments even exist anymore i mean may, maybe maybe it's it's a anarcho-capitalist pipe dream to think that the entire world is is going to throw off the shackles of governments and and turn into entirely consensualist pri uh, private city organized societies something like that but uh, I, I think it's very likely that we're going to see some kind of uh, private city model really take over when when bitcoiners get together and and form these citadels in jurisdictions that are uh, at least at least friendly towards that idea the the free private cities model that uh, Titus Gables uh, um, it, it, uh, 
Tipolis, I think, is his his organization. But the Free Private Cities Foundation is is uh, uh, one of the things he's he's involved with. Uh, it, it, it's 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 a fascinating idea. There there are so many of these private cities projects. There's uh, there's one in Honduras. There's uh, there's um, some of these types of projects in in. Uh, uh, for example, there's one in Norway, in uh, I believe it's uh, is it North Macedonia. Uh, there's a bunch of these private cities popping up, and the idea is that someone owns the city and has the has the uh, uh, provides security for its its residents and all this, and then the residents come in and sign a contract, and that's it. Everything else is so. There's there's a fee to live in the city, but other than that, everything else is is down to purely consensualist interaction and uh well it, it's an interesting idea and uh, the, the other other concepts like uh, free economic zones are interesting like D dubai has found massive amounts of of uh for example just business interest by creating a low taxation environment where business can come businesses can come in and, and set up shop there and uh and, and so i mean this is this is atlas shrug right this is this is uh, John Galt going going away and leaving the society and and yeah it, 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 these types of models I think are going to attract Bitcoiners which is then going to attract all the all the capital of the the world and then these free private cities might be some of the uh, most attractive places to go live and the governance model would be something that's entirely different from from the the type of of governance we see today but but maybe that's just a dream maybe that's maybe that's going to happen to some limited extent but it, we'll still have the the states the modern states that we we currently have for quite some time it's possible and i think in in that regard it's it's very likely that that governments will have less ability to control things this is this is sort of my optimistic take on something that's at least still uh at least grounded in the systems that we we currently have governments i think would would have much less capability to 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 extract from its its populace right if you have money that is all based in bitcoin right Be because Let's set aside that uh, anything of like that that Bitcoin would replace all the money. There might be some layers on top of Bitcoin that are that are still resembling the the fiat monetary system. Let's just sort of play with that for a second. That governments might still have some kind of currency, but that it's it's backed to some amount of, of Bitcoin. I, I could see that still happening. Uh, so so maybe the maybe the idea is that to live in this country you have to pay some type of income tax and and this government currency still has to be deducted from your paycheck or something like that those things could still happen but if someone just has the ability to pay someone directly not go through government payroll systems various other things like that well then okay then then there's more optionality to opt out of these systems right and so I, I think I think governments will have a lot less ability to control their populace in the future, and it's it's interesting because the sort of left wing left wing right wing divide that we currently have in in politics, it's less it's less pronounced in Europe, but of course in in America, the uh, Canada, the UK, it's it's pretty left right. Uh, Political parties that want to do less, that want to be more freedom oriented, while well, they're on the right side of the political spectrum. So to me, it makes perfect sense that more people from the right side of politics would figure out Bitcoin before people on the left side. Now, the, if you come at it from the from the sort of so-called progressive angle where Bitcoin can be used as a tool to help disadvantaged people and to fix a, a broken capitalist system. OK, I mean, that's that's how we, we get people on the so-called left that are figuring Bitcoin out. But then I think what happens to a lot of people that come at it from the traditional left perspective, they start to want the government to also do less and less and be less and less involved and just leave it up to fixing the the monetary system and so it's it's a complicated issue because to to me I think it's it's asymptotically approaching a state where there is no such thing as as a state no such thing as as a political system as we currently have it and democracy might have functioned for the last couple hundred years in most of the world 
But democracy has its own flaws. As Knut likes to say, four guys can vote to beat up the fifth guy, right? And and so I think the, the thing there is that uh, if people have the ability to opt out of these so-called uh, out of these democratic institutions, they, they won't function the same way anymore. It, it needs the buy-in of the, the whole population for the entire institution to even make sense. And uh, models that are approaching some kind of like real minimum governance model, uh, some some mainstream libertarians advocate for still a state, but all the state does is security, basically. Those things I could see happening eventually, but the governance model, maybe it's not something that looks like democracy anymore because that just might be outdated. It might not be needed that that the the population votes for the things they want. So we will have to see how it plays out. And I think there will be a lot of variation throughout the world because it's it's not going to be that Bitcoin affects things at the same pace throughout the whole world. Adoption is going to take uh, take time, take a different amount of time in different places and, and all this. So we will have to see. Yeah, and it's, I had the author of uh, Bitcoin Nations also on, Michael Anton Fisher, uh, and, and he said something that I never heard before, which is really interesting. Um, once you have taxes, you cannot have democracy. Like whenever there is taxes, uh, uh, that are forced onto the populace. Uh, democracy is just a time away to, uh, not function anymore, which is an interesting thought. Uh, because of course, like when you are forced to do something, it's, it's may maybe it's not that it's a real democracy or then you we have to define democracy. But yeah. Um, is, is like when, when I, uh, listen to you, uh, is, is the Bitcoin award at the elections, especially because this year I feel like almost everybody listening now has, has an election, like America has elections, EU has elections, Austria also has elections. I mean, uh, and, and there are a lot of other countries that also have election. Is the Bitcoin award not to vote? I don't think so. Now, th now this is, this is a thing. There's, there's, Certainly two camps here, vote or not vote. Absolutely. I don't think that's the thing to do. The, the current systems still exist and can have an effect on individual lives. Absolutely. I'll use Finland as an example here. The, uh, just recently, a, a fairly right-wing coalition got in, in Finland and uh, a sort of ethno-nationalist populist party was part of the, the governing coalition. They were the second most popular party in the vote. And I have nothing against parties like that forming a part of the government if they really are that popular, right? But the effect for me personally is that some of the immigration laws are going to, to tighten up. And, and so it's a little bit more difficult for me personally to make things work. And then to complicate matters a little bit is that I would have really had no good options to, to vote for in this election, even if I had the right to vote in Finland, uh, because they, they do have some sort of liberal parties that like, and I think that's that's sort of small L liberal, like uh, uh, Austrian economics liberal, but but they're so unpopular, they're not going to get any seats in the parliament and go they're going to have zero influence even if they do, right? And so And so theoretically, there is no Bitcoin party in this election, right? But if any one of these parties were to come in and say out of the 11 or something that get into parliament and, and say, if any of these parties were to come in and say that they want to advocate for adopting Bitcoin, well then, okay, vote for that. But in cases where it's not obvious, it's still worthwhile to, to put your hand up and, and vote for the, the thing that is, is going to make life the least unbearable in the short term. I still think that's I still think that's valid. Now others are are of uh, opposite opinions and and I can see the point where uh don't give validity to these systems, right? But then it's just letting life kind of go on without you and and you sort of have to just abide by the decisions and and vote with your feet. Voting with your feet or voting with your wallet are the become the only options. And maybe those should be the only options, but there certainly can be cases where it makes sense to vote for political parties of, of one persuasion. And, and back to sort of one of the reasons I bring up kind of the, the example from Finland, like a right wing coalition theoretically should be more interested in the economy and the uh, 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 making making less taxes and spending less money. But the, the, these 
parties have not done that. They they have raised taxes. They've they're raising VAT, which I think is specifically the worst tax to to implement because it it's it it hits the lowest rung of the population the hardest. And I don't mean that in the sense of a, a, some sort of social justice way. I just mean that it's it's the thing that's going to make inflation hurt the worst. So 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 VAT is is just a, absolutely a ridiculous tax. I I, I think it. it yeah, I, I want to get rid of all the taxes eventually, but but the, that one can go uh, pretty high on the on the list. Um, but so, so this party has raised raised VAT, uh, and they've they've raised um, well they've they've done they've done a bunch of cutting, but they're also raising various other taxes and all this, and so it's just that you can't win, right? There is no side where it's like, okay, I'm going to vote more to the right because they're going to cut taxes and cut regulations and things. They they say that, but it, it doesn't end up happening. In Canada, the choice is a little bit more clear. Uh, that's that's the other example is that right now we have Justin Trudeau in, in power over there, and he's on the left side of the political spectrum there. And there is a, a conservative, more on the right challenger to him. And I think in the short term, it's going to be nothing but a good thing to get Justin Trudeau out of governing that country. But over the last 20 years, 30 years, that, that same conservative party has been in power and they have done things that have not been very freedom oriented. And so, yeah, it, it's it's sort of just picking your poison. But I think if you don't vote, you, you don't really get to complain. All you can do is vote with your feet or vote with your wallet. And uh, uh, so I, I think I think in cases where there would be a meaningful uh, change in the short term. Yeah, um, voting is is one thing, and influencing the political process is is another. Uh, Bitcoiners coming together and actually saying, "Hey, we exist, and and we would like you to be friendly to Bitcoin, and here are the reasons why." Eventually, that will get the attention of of politicians, and the United States has, I think, been the best example of understanding this and and picking up the 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 bitcoin narrative at least on the 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 republicans over there have have started to do more uh towards bitcoin but yeah it seems like it's really not happening so much in in europe or uh other other parts of the world you get you get isolated single politicians even javier Millet in argentina he's he's no bitcoiner uh we i i spoke with we spoke with uh um uh, a guy who who knows him at, uh personally not not like closely but had been in contact with him and trying to orange pill him and and everything uh, ariel aguilar uh from the bitcoineta uh project these these bitcoin bands that you you might see sometimes in in europe but uh yeah i, I mean mele might be this uh this uh, serious libertarian guy and uh kind of cool uh against the system a little bit but he's definitely not uh, definitely not a Bitcoiner. He's 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 not pro Bitcoin. So I think we've got a long way before before Bitcoin is going to be a, a part of political parties uh, positions uh, throughout the world here. And that would be the point where where the Bitcoin vote would be no brainer. Uh, I think uh, single issue voter absolutely as long as that single issue is on the ballot. Yeah, the thing that I like about Javier Malé, uh and I, I might be wrong, but uh, he wants a free competition between all currencies, uh, which is like the best step I've seen from a big nation like that. Uh, when the leader says, oh, uh, we want at least a free competition between Bitcoin, between the, the fiat currency, between maybe even other cryptocurrencies, which is fine for me because I feel like in every free market, Bitcoin will win. So like when we have free markets, that's great. Like he doesn't have to be a Bitcoiner. He just has to let the free market make its things. <laughs> so that's like, uh, when he actually is like that, when he actually wants to do that, uh, that's, uh, that's amazing. And it's a pretty big step forward, but definitely he's not a Bitcoiner. Like I've seen some interviews, uh, and he's far away from a new book. Definitely. Yeah. Um, but let's come back to an individual level, uh, as you are also like on the, Freedom Footprint Show, uh, as you have also the, the co-off of the, the Clown World, where you also said it's a little bit of about uh, individual freedom and individual clown world <laughs> inversing. Um, how do you enhance your own Freedom Footprint? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Thank you. Yeah, so so me personally, 
personally, it, my, my way to do that has been to start to direct as much of my energy as possible towards Bitcoin. And I was, I was sort of down a different rabbit hole before I came into Bitcoin. The, my, my way into Bitcoin was via Jordan Peterson. Uh, he, he really helped me straighten myself out back in my, in my mid to late 20s. Uh, I was a bit directionless and, and didn't quite have uh, this understanding of, of how life worked properly. Uh, and and so Jordan Peterson really helped me out with that, especially his his maps of meaning lectures and also his maps of meaning book, and and so I I ended up seeing uh, Robert Breedlove on the Lex Friedman podcast, and uh, he talked about Jordan Peterson and his influence on 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 him, and and he was talking about Bitcoin there, and that was the first thing that actually got me to think, okay, should I be looking into this more? Then I watched the Sailor series, and well, that's uh, that was it. I was I was hooked. So I came at this from the angle of of individual personal responsibility. That was really my my angle the the whole time, and that that Bitcoin really could align with that the the most, and be the be this tool for removing the noise of the world so that you can find your own signal. I, re I really resonated with ideas like that. That's a Jeff Boothism to to a certain extent, uh, finding the signal through the noise. Uh, but but so, so the the angle that that I came at this was was always for that and so uh, finding finding the meaning uh, in in life and and finding the way to uh, finding finding my my purpose and so increasing my personal freedom footprint has been to start working on Bitcoin and what I was originally looking for was. Uh, first, first I got involved with Knut's publisher. They they produced translations of, of Bitcoin books uh, to a whole bunch of languages, including Finnish. And the the thing about this is that uh, I, I thought it was really strange that there was a, a company translating books into into Finnish. It's an obscure language, five million people, and only used in one country, and all this. And so I I, I was excited about that. I, I wanted to get involved and. Uh, so I, I, I contacted them and, and uh, got involved doing that. We're, we're no longer uh, with, with them anymore, but, but uh, yeah, definitely still, um, still uh, happy to have, have gotten connected with, with Knut uh, through Consensus Network there. Um, but the, the thing with that was the, this podcast was just the perfect way for me to kind of get that going. I, I'd had a podcast before I got into Bitcoin all about Norse mythology and uh, Finnish mythology, and uh, it was it was uh, actually a, a, an attempt to uh, study stories through a, a sort of Petersonian lens. He bro he breaks down uh, stories from an archetypal perspective and gets into uh, gets into a perspective of how story structure can can tell profound ideas in a, a really a simple way that also aligns with how we are wired biologically and psychologically. So I attempted to do that. He had done that with with some biblical stories, especially the book of Genesis. And I attempted to do that through for Norse mythology, essentially, and it found its own little following. And uh, it, it was a lot of work to to do. It's not it wasn't like a I didn't we did interviews, but it, it was it was a, a lot different from an interview show for sure. But uh, I, I had done podcasting. I had learned how to do it. I had learned the the technical aspects. And so when I came into Bitcoin, I probably would have honestly done the same thing you are doing, Robin. Just tried to try to start up a podcast and and see how that goes. And and uh, I, I know that's a that's a the hard road. Just uh, just uh, bootstrapping that up. So yeah, good good on you for that. And I think we absolutely need more Bitcoin podcasts. Even though if sometimes on Bitcoin Twitter you get. Uh, uh, some people making snarky comments about it. everyone's got a Bitcoin podcast these days, but it's such a great way to get people to explain their ideas in in a in a more open format, and uh, it's it's a great companion. It it it, it cer podcasts certainly helped me. Uh, you know, Breed loves what his money show and and uh, what Bitcoin did. Daniel Prince is once bitten. Uh, tons of podcasts. TFTC. Uh, I don't know. I, I can't shout them all out. I definitely can't. And this was back in back in like two, two, 2021 or so, 2021, 2022, when I was first um, kind of going down the rabbit hole there. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, this was how I could contribute, basically. And so I I uh, got involved um, with, with Knut, started the Freedom Footprint show. The name is based on a, a quote from, from Everything Divided by 21 Million. And it's yeah, just this idea that 
don't worry about your carbon footprint. Uh, worry about your freedom footprint. And uh, yeah, that's sort of sort of stuck. And uh, uh, so the the main thing with the the pod, my my reason for doing it is to try to amplify voices that have this freedom perspective. And we talk to Bitcoiners, we talk to Bitcoin adjacent people. We won't talk to shit coiners, but we'll we'll basically talk to to anyone that's sort of in this uh, freedom orientation that isn't trying to scam people. And uh, yeah, so the idea is just to amplify these voices and to to bounce ideas around because having someone as unique as Knut in the picture, uh, he 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 takes conversations in his own unique direction. I'll just say that. And the idea there is that uh, he's he's always got these ideas kicking around and uh, bouncing them off the guests has basically turned into that. Uh, we've got enough material for yeah uh, a book, and I'm I'm really proud of. Uh, this book, I'm proud of being involved in the the process. Uh, the the way we we write together is like Knut has has written the the text, but then we go over it all together, make sure that the ideas all make sense. And uh, does this sentence make sense here? Do we need to add something there? And so it's really been a collaborative process of of writing the thing. But but Knut at the end of the day is the is the author extraordinaire, and I, I absolutely would not want to take any more credit than than is due. He's he's going to be the first one listed on the on the cover for good reason. But I'm I'm proud and happy to be there with him and and helping to produce this book. And so the the book and the pod are the ways that I'm doing that. I've also the 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 other way as well is that I've I've got a series on um, Rob Breed loves what is money show on Jordan Peterson's maps of meaning. I'm really proud of that as well. Really, really proud of that. Uh, I, it's, it's a niche topic, uh, but if you're at all interested in, in Jordan Peterson's material and you want to kind of get it through a Bitcoiner angle, Rob and I have both been really influenced by Jordan Peterson's work. And it's a deep dive where I think it's going to be 11 episodes by the end of the the series we we just have to wrap it up. There's at least two episodes yet to come out that are already recorded. So um, yeah, I'm re- I'm really proud of that. So those are all ways that I'm trying to spread these messages and reach more people. So that's the way I'm personally expanding my freedom footprint. Wow, there was a there was a lot in there. <laughs> First of all, like uh, thank you for the for the remarks of the podcast. Yeah, it's it's a hard thing to do, but I actually have to. Um, convince i'm actually convinced that everybody should have some form of um expressing themselves i I mean like nobody like not everybody has to have a podcast i mean what is a podcast anyways it's for me it's usually it's actually just a youtube show where i interview people like what what's what's considered a podcast at these days just that it's on spotify also i don't know (laughs) but if it's a podcast then but yeah you can you can make the argument that's a podcast um but i think everybody would benefit Im- immensely just from expressing themselves if it's a blog or a book or a podcast or just like once a week they are putting some short form video on 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 youtube and the great thing is you don't even have to dox yourself you can just be anonymous uh, and make even like your you can even uh, um, uh transform your voice and do it in that way like you, you can just be completely anonymous and put the things out there. And I think everyone um, benefits from that immensely. There's like, I learn from every episode something uh, and from the exchange with the community and also from like putting your thoughts into some form of content um, benefits from you personally a lot. So I, I love that you mentioned that, uh, that uh, point. And also like the maps of meaning, I saw the l- playlist I wanted to see, <laughs> but then I was like, oh, it's a lot of episodes. Uh, I will look into this uh, once I have, uh, have more time, but I, I quickly looked over it. I know Jordan Peterson, uh, quite a lot, uh, but I did not know about maps of meaning too much. I was, how was this book called? 12 Rules of Life, I think it's called, the other book. This was really good. So I like his work a lot. Uh, I feel like he's really good, especially on video. On Twitter, he sometimes gets a little out of range. <laughs> but especially on video, he's amazing. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, and if b- before we come to the end uh, end of the podcast, maybe uh, for people that want to see Jordan Peterson and Maps of Meaning, can you, I mean, you're making with Robert Breedler for like an, an 10 hour series about that. So it's pre- pretty hard to break it down in like a quick excitement, but maybe let's try like 
can you like summarize what, what's maps of meaning and why should people like uh, watch this? Because I feel like it's, it's, it's a really good one. Oh yeah. Awesome. And, uh, no, yeah, thanks. And, uh, it, this is, this has been a big, a big project for me and, and yeah, summarizing this, I'll, I'll do my best. The, the maps of meaning for, first of all, the, this is Jordan Peterson's first book. Uh, the, the version I have is published in 1999. I think that's the, I think that's the original publication date. Uh, and so it's, it's already, it's already like 25 years old at, at this point. And 12 rules for life was sort of a, a distillation of, of these messages after another 20, 25 years of, of talking. Maps of Meaning is a book about psychology, biology, but especially about, about archetypal narrative. And archetypal narrative is the idea that the most important stories in the world boil down to a certain uh, set of characters that represent real things in the human experience. And real is, in, in this sense, is a little bit that uh, the chair that I'm sitting on is real. The microphone I'm talking into is real as in physically tangible, but other things that are real are as abstract concepts such as belief uh, the, uh, or, or the, I, the idea of the, the known versus the unknown, the, the entire concept of the things that you know, that's, that's real. And so the, the idea is that people have been forming stories to communicate things about the world. First of all, before there was anything like writing, but it was also a way of communicating deep ideas about how to act in the world. And so the a, a really common archetypal story is sort of this hero's journey that's been popularized by Joseph Campbell. There's only one type of story, but a really basic hero story is something where th there, there's always a great father and a great mother the 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 father represents the the realm of the known literally the patriarchy and the mother represents chaos and and this is that's a controversial thing and i don't want to to dig into the weeds you'll you'll have to uh take my word for it or well not take my word for it verify please uh, uh to check out the series but uh uh, the idea is the the world falls into disrepair somehow and you you need a, a hero who is usually the child of these these two figures to to come and and repair the world and the hero is the one who can uh who pays attention and who is able to take up the the mantle and and tame the forces of the the unknown world uh and so this could be slaying a dragon this could be uh, slaying some some uh, mythical monster or something like that. It's a it's a threat to the civilization. And then, and then this hero then eventually is able to to change the world for the better. And and that's the the hero's story, the really basic hero story. The one in Maps of Meaning cited is the story of uh, Marduk, the Mesopotamian original hero. And there are other uh, there are other stories that that uh, it gets into there. There's Egyptian mythology. There's Norse mythology, which I dig into a little bit more. Uh, but the the book in general, first of all, starts by breaking down how we think psychologically about unknown things happening. Like what what if the elevator out of your building is out of service? What if the 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 stairwells are are blocked? Something like that. Is that going to make you late for your meeting, or is that going to make you potentially? Uh, die in a in a fire in your building, something like that. We have we have different responses to to different things there, uh, and then he has a short but very very good chapter about how this all actually is backed up by by neurobiology. And that was impressive to me because he's he's not complete. He's not pulling this out of his ass. He's, it, this is rooted in 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 actual biology, the way the way people navigate the world, and then it's a long massive exploration of different types of stories and what they mean. And the, the thesis of the book, just to get to the end here, is that the, the book says that the, the best way of, of finding meaning is to find the highest good you can conceive of, take that up as the mantle, and become the hero and become the savior of the, the world. Do, do make the best effort to do that, and it's, it's hard. Uh, the figure of, of Jesus Christ is, is the culmination of of this story in western civilization and that might be a little uncomfortable for people who have some religious um baggage i i have some i i was raised christian and i don't consider myself a christian anymore but through reading this book i have much greater appreciation for for christian thought christian theology what i reject is dogma i reject the the dogma of the large religious institutions but the message of of Christianity, at least in the archetypal form, is very, very good. So the series that I've done with Rob 
is going to be explaining these things from a lay person's perspective. Neither of us has done anything but just read this book deeply uh, and and had all the Bitcoin stuff and other life experiences to to tie into it. It's got a lot in common with Austrian economics without having any knowledge of it. Uh, and there's a cool section at the end that implies that Bitcoin is the final form of the centuries, if not thousands of year, thousands of years long pursuit of alchemy. So uh, hopefully that's a little teaser. But our series is is one way of, of learning more about this. I also recommend Jordan Peterson's own lecture series, the Maps of Meaning lecture series that he recorded at the University of Toronto while he was still there. Those are still up on YouTube. They're fantastic. Uh, and so you, you can take that route or if you're uh, wanting a more Bitcoin oriented take, then mine and Rob's series is, is uh, the way to go. So that's on the What is Money channel. Love it, love it. Um, before we come to the end routine, uh, one quick question. What are you currently extremely passionate about uh, besides Bitcoin, besides your book, besides me, <laughs> all the things that we already talked about? Is there anything else that you are deeply researching and doing? The only thing that is a constant companion with me in my life is music. I, I love music. It's it's been one of those things that has has brought me lots of joy and and kept me going through hard times. I love discovering new music. Uh, I I uh, I'm playing in a in a band with with Knut and Nirvana cover band, also with uh, Samson Mo and uh, Mark from the Princess Hotel in Plokingen. And so stay tuned. Uh, we might be doing some gigs at uh, conferences if uh, we're all there at the same time. But uh, the playing of music is less important for me these days. I used to be really into playing playing music, but th these days it's it's more just a, a tool to make the, the world more uh, more bearable for me. I, I, I wish I had uh, something else to, to add than that, but man, life is packed at the moment uh, writing a book while running a pod while having a full-time job and i've got a new kid and, and and all this it's it's uh life is packed the days go by fast and i i feel like i don't have enough time in the day for everything i need to do but somehow somehow uh the, the things are getting done and uh we're 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 hurtling towards the release date of the inverse of clown world it will be out on august 21st that's bitcoin infinity day so still a little ways to to go hopefully uh, yeah well I, I assume this episode will be out before then but but uh yeah bitcoin infinity day so yeah after that maybe i'll have a little bit more time in my brain to to think about other things but i uh at the moment i i tend to fill my life with with bitcoin uh for the most part and my family and uh staying in shape and uh listening to music that i like and uh yeah the, that's me uh I, I, I appreciate the, the hustle for Bitcoin. And yes, the, the podcast episode will out, be out probably before June even. Uh, so it, it will be definitely uh, out before the book. <laughs> um, uh, we have an end routine in the podcast where the previous guest asked the question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Um, and your question from the previous guest is, if you invest 10 euros every week in Bitcoin from 2014 to 2024, how much do you think gut feeling would it be now uh, in total 10 euros every week for 10 years uh, it's an investment of, of over two uh, five thousand euros uh, but then there's the of course the price appreciation of bitcoin since 2014 in there uh, do you have any gut feelings uh, i'm thinking it's in the millions at the moment uh, starting in 2014 definitely i don't have an exact line on the on the price but what would the amount of bitcoin be i I feel like that's got to be at least 20, 30 Bitcoin. Uh, I'll, I'll go 2 million euros, something like that. I love it because you were as wrong as I, <laughs> I was also. <laughs> it's, it's just 300,000. Uh, yeah, actually, that's it's, 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 so it's, uh, it's like, okay, that's five or six Bitcoin, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that is around that. Uh, and then I was like, uh, I, I was also massively overshooting it because in 2014, the price was already around a thousand euros. Like it okay. was in the highest, yeah. like 800, 900. Uh, so 10 euros is like, it, it went down the year. I think it was down like to 300 euros in 2014. Uh, but it's an interesting, uh, thing to do. But I also massively overshot and, the, the, <laughs> I was like, really? I, I was like, I think I said 8 million, uh, which was completely, uh, it was completely <laughs> wrong. 
but yeah um uh, you have done the honor after the after the recording to put up a, a question for the next guest and 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 <laughs> mess him with him if you want <laughs> oh, okay you're, you're not uh, gonna put me on the on the spot i'll, I'll no, give it no, to you no, afterwards I, I, right. I, so, some uh, guests actually do that on them on their own because they're like, oh, it's, I, I have already. I, I, Knut actually did it. Uh, sure. the, he uh, said after his answer directed the question for the next guest, and without me having the chance. To <laughs> uh, but uh, I try to give the guests like like two seconds to think about uh, without the recording lo running and because it's um, a little sure, bit more sure. relaxed. Uh, <laughs> perfect. Then, <laughs> okay. uh, thank you for being on, uh, uh, Luke. Thank you for taking the time before I let you go. Where can people find you? Where can people ask you questions? Yes. Thanks. So my, my ex profile is uh, Luke DeWolf, first name, last name. Uh, so yeah, simple enough. And on uh, Noster, you can find me at primal.net slash Luke. I, I snapped up that real estate. So uh, cheers to Million at Primal for, for uh, alerting me to that that one was available. So that's great. Uh, and the Freedom Footprint Show is is on all major platforms. You'll find it if you search that. Freedomfootprintshow.com is our website. And we're on YouTube Fountain as well. Uh, definitely encourage encourage if you're listening to podcasts, if you don't want to do it on uh, YouTube and see the video, go to, go to Fountain because, yeah, it's the way to help artists. I, I assume you've got uh, your channel on there, right, Robin? Absolutely, yes. And, and I, I'm always... Uh, uh... I should have said I'm always really satisfied with getting SaaS from there. It's like, wow, people could listen to it completely for free. They don't have to give me anything for it. Like it's on every platform for free, but they still choose to give something to the original offer, which is, yeah, it's an amazing thing. Yeah. Yeah. Value for value is fantastic. So I think those are the places uh, at Luke DeWolf on, on X slash Twitter. Let's be real. It's still Twitter. Uh, and if you want to find me on Noster, primal.net slash Luke. Will be a long time till we call it X. <laughs> it has to prove itself. Uh, perfect. Thank you, Luke, uh, for being on. Thank you for everyone watching. And yeah, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye bye.